Welcome everyone to the Cybersecurity Chat Series. I'm Mark Lupker from the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation, and we have a treat for you today. We're very happy to have Justin Troutman with us today. Justin is a cryptographer. He's based in San Francisco, but I understand he kind of grew up here on the East Coast. He specializes in cryptographic design and, and cryptographic analysis. Uh, a thing we call operational security, or we love our acronyms called OPSEC, open source intelligence gathering and social engineering. Now he's currently building a thing called Pocket Block, which I'm sure he'll share with you about. It's a gamified visual language for realizing cryptographic engineering for everyone. So Justin, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Excellent, Mark. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining us. I'm I'm looking forward to, to getting into exactly what a cryptographer does. Uh, so just to give you a quick idea, we're going to walk through a little bit of the history of cryptography or what it means to design a cryptographic algorithm, uh, and then from there I'm going to talk a bit about how I got into the field and why I got into the field, and sort of what you can do to prepare yourself if information security or more specifically cryptography is something you're interested in doing. So with that, I'm going to share some slides and we'll get started. This talk is going to sort of take you through the history of cryptography into the more modern stuff. And I'm going to be sure to talk about how this applies to the real world today, because it can get a little, a little, uh, you know, tricky thinking about cryptography and how it applies because it, it, it seems very esoteric and it seems very obscure and hard to really wrap your head around how we actually use this term benefit. But starting very early on in cryptography. Let's go back to the 7th century BC. What you're looking at here is an ancient Greek uh, invention called the Skytail. And basically what it is, is a, a long cylindrical staff of wood. And they take either paper or leather or some kind of parchment that they can easily cut into a strip. They wrap it around the stick. They write their message across, as you can see. And this one has very clear flat sides, so it makes it really easy to write the message. And once they write their message across the stick and they unravel the string, the message is going to appear vertically instead of across. So if you're looking at the strip from top to bottom, it's going to look like a bunch of random characters. And this is probably the earliest known cryptographic device that we have, going back to the you know 7th century BC. That's a long, long time ago. And the, the key thing to point out here is that cryptography has been around for a long time. And it has been a part of the advancement of technology, and it's also, around World War II, been responsible for the advancement of technology. Because it's one of those things that started out early on as a military type of thing, that is, cryptography. So the, the impetus for, you know, enhancing our knowledge and understanding of this was a really big deal, because it really had a profound impact, conflict, and military operations, you know, going back thousands of years. So the way this stick would have worked is... Two parties that wanted to transmit a message would have to agree at some point about the size of the stick. Because you can imagine that if you didn't have the same size stick and you wrapped the parchment that you received around it, the characters wouldn't line up. So our earliest assumption here is that they would have used this as a way to communicate, you know, very simple, you know, operational militaristic type of messages. So let's say one general in one location wanted to transmit a message to someone. Elsewhere, they would first wrap this around the stick, write their message. They would give this parchment to a courier, and that courier would travel some distance, relay that message, uh, and then they would authenticate this by wrapping it around the appropriate string, around the appropriate size stick, and then they can read the message from there. Uh, so it's very likely that they weren't encrypting messages so much as just using this as a simple means of authentication. But this is, you know, one of the earliest known uh, applications that we have of, of cryptography uh, in the real world. Now, moving on from there, and this might be one that you've heard about before. Uh, it's called the Enigma. So at the end of World War I, uh, there was a German engineer who came up with this device. And he was, you know, he was an engineer, but he was sort of in this new area of cryptography where they were trying to sell devices to militaries and governments. Uh, so there were a lot of different attempts to build machines like this. It just so happened that the Enigma was quite secure for the time, and this particular engineer was also uh, a pretty good salesman. Uh, so he worked on various uh, you know, varieties of this design 
until he come up with the one that would eventually be used by Nazi Germany for, for the majority of their land, air, and sea traffic. And the way this device worked, if you look at the picture there, you can see what looked like keys of a keyboard and an early typewriter. Uh, and then below that, you'll see these black wires, and you'll see some characters there. Uh, and that was called the plug board. And the way this would work, if you wanted to type a message, you could rearrange the patterns of this plug board, and every time you typed a message, the result would be a bit different. And then if you look slightly above the typewriter keys there, you'll see some circles. Those are the light, that's the lamp board, and there are lights that will light up whenever you're pressing the corresponding typewriter key, so that lights up to show you which letter's being encrypted. And then above that, you'll see what look like three little rotor wheels. Now, there were different devices during this period of time that had different numbers of rotors. This particular one had three rotors, and the rotors could be shifted forwards or backwards in different arrangements to make things even more complicated. So if you were receiving a message and you wanted to decrypt it, you would have to know how the plug board cables were arranged at the bottom, and you'd also have to know placement of the rotors. So it was a really complex system, but for the time, it was fairly compact. It was incredibly secure. Uh, it would take a lot of work, and essentially the invention digital computing would come as a result of what it would take to, to break this kind of device. Uh, so the Enigma's uh, imagine one of the most well-known cryptographic devices in history, and one you've probably heard of. Uh, and if anyone's ever heard of the film The Imitation Game, that one showcased it uh, quite well. So it does get uh, a lot more treatment than other cryptographic devices just because of its place in history. But this was an electromechanical device, and it was really the last one of the last devices we would see of this type before we would start shifting into the computing age uh, to you know, digital uh, types of ciphers that we have today. Now, this person, you might or might not know who Claude Shannon is yet, uh, but I can guarantee you that even if you get into computer science, not even information security or cryptography, you'll learn very quickly about Claude Shannon. Uh, he was quite quite a character. Uh, he's known as the father of information theory. Uh, he's one of the first to experiment with artificial intelligence, which is becoming a really big deal today. One example is the you know autonomous uh, vehicle industry that I work in. I so said a lot of applications for artificial intelligence that he had an early part in. Alan Turing, uh, he regularly had lunch with Alan Turing at Bell Labs. And I point that out because Alan Turing, again, is somebody you'll probably either already be familiar with or will likely learn about if you get into even general computer science. Uh, and he was at the forefront of breaking the Enigma device that we just looked at and part of building the computing devices that would be responsible for decrypting those messages. Uh, for the British. Uh, he did this in tandem uh, with Polish crypt analysts uh, and American crypt analysts at that time uh, had a huge part in developing different methods of crypt analysis as well. Uh, and uh, as a side, you know, he, he definitely was the father of information theory and had a big part in early cryptographic uh, design and the understanding of what it meant to build a secure cryptographic algorithm. But a little interesting tidbit there is that he co-founded the Unicycling Society of America. And if you go back and you look at World War II, or, or just go back in history and look at the different people that were part of the cryptographic community, you'll see that they had so many widely varying uh, interests, from being a you know, fairly prolific poet, uh, along with Elizabeth Friedman, uh, who was a, uh, had a profound impact on, on cryptanalytical design, you know, prior to World War II, uh, and then you know Alan Turing. There, there are a ton of folks. Uh, so I, I implore you to. Uh, to to really champion your your own interests, even if they don't seem to you know have a clear connection with computer science, just having your mind expanded and, and thinking about the world and thinking about things in so many different ways, I think really built Claude Shannon into who he would become. And he also coined the term "bit" in the forties, so a term that we're all familiar with now came out of some early research from, from uh, Claude Shannon. Now. What Claude Shannon did, and we won't talk too much more about uh, Claude Shannon himself, but he was responsible for really two of the fundamental things that still permeate cryptographic design today. And he wrote a paper in 1948, and it's interesting, I think you might find it interesting, that what he defined in 1948 is still the hallmark of how we design things today in 2020. And these two 
properties of a secure block cipher, and I'll get into what a block cipher is momentarily. It's called confusion and diffusion. So if you go back to the time of Julius Caesar or uh, even before that, and you look at cryptography today, all throughout history, you'll see this theme of confusion and diffusion. So what does that mean? So we're going to take a look at what it means to confuse and diffuse a message. So probably when you think about encrypting, you think about taking a message and scrambling it up. And that's exactly what happened. But what does that mean to scramble it up? So confusion is what we call substituting one value for another. So I'm not sure how many of you have played Mario 3. I know we're, we're pretty well beyond that in gaming. But in Super Mario 3, which came out, I believe, in the late 80s, Mario had this ability to change uh, with a special suit into a completely different character uh, that could keep him hidden from these bad guys. Uh, so in cryptography, if we want to encrypt a message and make it hard to understand, we might take a value like, let's say, the word dog, D-O-G, we might change the value of D to X, or O to Q, or P to C. Uh, and we might have a very complex way of going about deciding how these things change from one character to another. And that sort of rounds out what we mean by an algorithm. It's essentially just a set of instructions that we come up with says, okay, anytime you find the letter D, you change it to this. Uh, or we might have it so that it's not always changed to the same character. So the first time you find a D, you change it to a P. The next time you find a D, you change it to an X. And you could do this for the entire alphabet. And you can imagine, uh, even with something simple like that, that you could arrive at something you know, very complex and very hard to understand if you're an adversary trying to break a message. Now, the other property in cryptography is called diffusion. And this one's perhaps a little bit harder to think about but a Rubik's Cube is probably the clearest example. So if any of you, I imagine all of you have picked up a Rubik's Cube, there are different colors along the side. Now, when you turn the side, it doesn't change the color of any of the squares, it just changes the arrangement. And the idea is that a Rubik's Cube is hard to solve because you have to know how to turn the different sides in order to get the same color on each side. So nothing's actually changing. It still has the same number of squares of the same you know, colors, you're just changing the order. And this is really important because when you think about language, when you're looking at the English language or the French language or German or Japanese, you can very easily start to see patterns in the length of words. And if you're really good and you, you're, let's say, working linguistics, per se, you can look and analyze language and you can perhaps determine what language uh, is being spoken or written based on uh, the length of words and the patterns and the intonation. So language has a lot of patterns in it that can be used to, to learn information. And the same is true for encrypting. So we want to make sure that we sort of rearrange the order of things and not just change the value. One example might be if I didn't change the order of something I was encrypting, and let's say it had uh, a one-letter word like A or a three-letter word like T-H-E or the, uh, anytime I see that, I might deduce that that is what that encrypted message means because I know this is in English and I see this pairing, I see this group of three letters uh, quite often in this sentence. So it probably is and or the or some common three letter word in the language. So when we're encrypting in the real world, we want to make sure we get rid of all these patterns and mix things up as much as possible. So what's the modern way? I mean, obviously we're not using sticks and wrapping parchment around sticks to encrypt things. Uh, so how do we do it in 2020? So block ciphers. So block ciphers are what you might think they, they are by the sound of the word block cipher. It is a block that handles chunks of data. And we arrange these into a matrix or a grid or a square. Uh, in modern day, you know, we use 128 bits or 16 bytes. Um, you know, 20 years ago, they might do half this, so 64 bits, 8 bytes. Uh, and you can go smaller or larger depending on, you know, what you're, you're trying to achieve. And examples of that would be, you know, we're certainly in the age of what we call the Internet of Things. So, so many devices that we have in our home are connected to the Internet. Not all of them can be as powerful as our laptop or our smartphone. So when we're designing cryptographic algorithms, we have to keep in mind that sometimes we don't have a lot of space or a lot of computing power to work with. So we have to design things that fit in tiny devices that aren't quite as powerful as our smartphones or our computers. 
Now, the AES, and again, if you get into computer science, you'll eventually come across AES, which is the Advanced Encryption Standard. Now, it's going to look pretty complex compared to, you know, what we talked about earlier with the SkyTel and the Enigma. So this is a 2D and 3D diagram of just one round or one sequence of the Advanced Encryption Standard. Now, you can imagine this being repeated, you know, 10 to 14 times, uh, depending on the size of the key you're using. So it looks complex, but to cryptographers, we consider AES to be one of the simpler designs. It's really, you know, really compact. It's not really complex compared to other designs. But if you just get into cryptography and you're trying to learn how things work, it, it, it does look a bit daunting. All right, so we're going to walk through a very simple block cipher that does everything that the advanced encryption standard does. It just does it in a way that we don't really have to have a math degree to understand. And that kind of makes up the pocket block project that I've been working on for quite some time, is to scale down these really complex algorithms to an audience that hasn't gotten into the necessary math or computer science yet to really understand how those work. But they can still understand all the components in a scaled down way and easier to compute with pen and paper kind of way. So to design a block cipher, we need a handful of things. So first, we need a key schedule. And a key schedule is basically another way of saying, just like a door that needs keys, we need keys to unlock our messages and lock our messages. And this is the secret piece. You know, just like you wouldn't, let's say, give something that's secret to you to just anybody, like your house keys. We want to keep this part secret. And a key schedule allows us to take a really small and make it into a bigger key that we can use across the different rounds of different uh, sequences of our algorithm. Now, in modern crypto, an S box or a substitution box is what we call the component that changes the character's value. That gives us, again, what we talked about with confusion. A P box or permutation box, that's another way to say transposition. So to permute the characters means that we're just moving them around in different places. We're not changing them. We want to change them, but we also want to scramble their order up so that no patterns are left behind. And that's known as a P box. And then a MAC or a message authentication code is a special thing that we can add to our message as sort of a, a way to authenticate that when we receive a message from somebody, it hasn't been changed or manipulated in any way. And that's important in modern day uh, cryptography because we're doing a lot of uh, purchasing online. So we want to make sure that when we buy something from Amazon or eBay or, or anything like that, that when we send our credit card information, that it's making it safely there and that nothing's being manipulated along the way. So it's really important to prevent people from trying to forge data to make it seem like it's something that it's not. So I'm going to walk through this one pretty quickly, but I'm going to make sure that I have links to all of this for all the teachers. That way, if you want to emulate this in the classroom, I've got a very clear set of instructions on how to walk through it. And, of course, I'm easily reachable to, to help with that as well. So we're just going to use the standard alphabet and the numbers 0 through 9. And this gives us 36 characters, so a 6 by 6 grid. And we're going to start with the keyword. And this keyword is what we're going to use to build our key. So let's just use the word secret. Now, in order to do some math, I need numbers, not letters. So I'm going to convert secret into a set of numbers. Now, if you're wondering how I got these numbers, I'm just putting a number under each letter regarding where it falls in the alphabets. So the first, so C comes earliest in the alphabet. I'm going to give it a 1. There are two E's, which would be the next, so I'm going to give the one on the left a 2, the one on the right a 3, then RST for, become 4, 5, and 6. So I'm just labeling based on where they come in the regular alphabet. Now, because I have multiple rounds or multiple sequences in the algorithm, I'm going to make sure that I schedule or expand the key into something so that each sequence gets its own key. So you might be familiar with uh, what we call the you know, uh, the Fibonacci sequence, and there's a type of math called chain addition based on that sequence. So if you look at the top, you'll see 5, 2, 1, 4, 3, 6. Now these were the numbers that rounded out the word C. So if I take 5 and the 2 and I add it together, I get 7, which becomes the first number in that first line. If I take the 2 and the 1, I add them, it becomes 3. The 1 and the 4 becomes 5, and I do that all the way across at the very end, the 5 and the 6, I take the, the 5 at the beginning and the 6 at the end. And in this type of math, we don't carry uh, any digits. So instead of 11, this last one becomes 1. 
then I use that line to build out the rest of the lines in the key. So when I do that, this entire grid of 36 numbers becomes this bigger key that I built from a smaller key. And this is what I'm going to use to make sure that each sequence has its own key. And this way, since I'm not encrypting the message multiple times with the same key, it makes it more complex because there's a different set of numbers being used every time. Now we need a message to encrypt. So we're going to take a message and we're going to write it across this grid so that everything's equal in size. We always want 36 characters, 36 numbers, so that we can make the math very easy to do. So this is a secret message that we need to hide. So I'm just writing that across and I made sure to write a message that fit perfectly in this square. If it doesn't fit perfectly, then you can take what's left and put it into a new block, and that will become an entirely new block that you'll encrypt separately. So in cryptography, the way we work on grids of data like this is that we treat it in the term of columns and rows. So we want to make sure that we're scrambling it based on the rows as well as the columns. Now, the first thing we can do is shift the columns up and down. And we're going to use the key, and I'll, I'll tell you how that works. So over on the upper left, you'll see our original message. In the middle, you'll see that the purple squares have moved. Now, all we're doing right now is permuting or using the P-box effect or diffusing the, the message. So in the first column, I'm using the 7 to move it down 7 spaces. So when you count down, it's going to wrap back around, and that T is going to be in that spot there. And then I'm going to take 3 is the second key value, and I'm going to move the second column down three places. So you can see where the H that was originally at the top is going to move down three places and be in that new position. Then I'm going to do that all the way across uh, until I've used my entire key, and that corresponds nicely to all these purple squares. So I move the columns down. Uh, so if you're looking at the upper left and then the middle, you can very easily see how the message looks across just by moving the columns down these number of spaces. So if you try to read this across now, it makes no sense. Uh, but this is still not too secure because adversaries and computing capabilities these days are pretty strong and able to reverse engineer a lot of things. So now we're going to work on the rows. Now that we move the columns down, we're going to shift the rows over. So I'm going to use the second set of key values. And up in the upper right, I'm just keeping a tally of which keys I've used so far. So in the middle, I'm moving the purple squares to the right. And after I do that, you can see in the upper left on this new screen how that the message is scrambled up even farther. So by scrambling just the columns and the rows, I haven't changed the value of anything yet, uh, but it's clear to see how the message is seemingly unreadable to the human eye without even having tried to analyze anything yet. Now, in this next one, I'm going to change the values. So I'm just going to to very easily go through the alphabet. So in the upper left, you'll see that purple square with the T. If you come down and you see this number value, the 808688, we're going to start with the number 8, and we're going to count forward in the alphabet eight places starting at the letter T. Now remember that we chose an alphabet that doesn't end with Z. It ends with 0 through 9 to make 36 characters. So if you don't stop at Z, and then you go from Z to 0 to 1 to 2, and you count eight spaces forward from T, you'll get the number one. So in this extended alphabet, we're going to go through, and each of these rows in this message are going to be moved according to this key, 808688. It's going to be moved forward in the alphabet. So we're changing the value. So now this message has have been shifted by columns, it's been shifted by rows, and the values have been changed based on this key. And now this part is called the S box which substitute the values. And very quickly, the message authentication part of this. I'm just going to create a simple grid here in the center with A, E, I, O, U, Y. Those are just the vowels. There's nothing special about that. I just want to be able to create what we call a lookup table with coordinates. And you might, depending on where you are in mathematics, you might have gotten to the whole you know, X and Y coordinates things and building out grids this way. That's essentially what I'm doing here, creating a lookup table. Now, I filled this middle square, or this middle grid, with all the numbers in our original key. Our ciphertext, or our final encrypted message, up in the upper left, what I'm going to do is find each of those characters in this middle grid, or oh, actually, up in the upper right, you'll see that I have the regular alphabet. That's going to be our actual lookup table. 
And to build this tag or authentication code, I'm going to take the one, let's say, in the upper left in that ciphertext message. I'm going to find where the one is in this alphabet, the regular alphabet lookup table in the upper right. So if I look there, I can see that the coordinates for where the one is in the lookup table is U and O. So I'm going to take the coordinates U and O, and I'm going to come to the center table that we have, this matrix with our key in it, and I'm going to find what is in the U, O position. So if I look at U and O, I drop down and I find the number zero. I'm going to do this for all the characters in our ciphertext until I end up with this, which is our message authentication code. And the utility of this is when you receive a message that's encrypted, even though it's encrypted, data today is in the form of packets. It has a very formatted kind of arrangement. And even if you can't read the message, adversaries have gotten really clever and there are lots of different attacks that will allow you to flip certain bits here and there that have some really malicious effect when you try to decrypt a message. Uh, so we include integrity checks or message authentication codes so that when you receive this message, you can take the ciphertext and the key that's been shared with you, and you can recompute this integrity check. And if what you come up with matches this set of numbers, then you know that the encrypted data hasn't been tampered with, and you can move forward with decrypting it. If it doesn't match, then you know that there's either been some error in transmission or someone's tried to change your message along the way, or they tried to change the message before it reached you. It might have some malicious consequence if you try to decrypt it and open it, or it might be simply false information. So we run through the same process, and I won't spend too much more time on this since we walked through it already. With the message authentication code, we go back through the permutation of the P-box, then we go through the substitution phase, and then what we end up with is our ciphertext on top, which is our encrypted message, and then our message authentication code on the bottom. Uh, so what you're looking at here is something that just like the advanced encryption standard, which encrypts modern traffic from Amazon to eBay, from when you're logging into play Fortnite, even, you know, making sure that connection is secure. All of this is using the advanced encryption standard. Uh, and it takes a message, it takes messages that are readable and it turns it into stuff like this. Now, this example, believe it or not, is not very secure uh, when it comes to what we're capable of breaking in 2020. Uh, but it does give you an idea of how to build something that looks and feels like modern crypto uh, without having to worry about all the complex math. And that's something, again, I can provide to all the educators if you'd like to walk through that with your students. So that wraps it up for this part. I want to make sure, I know we need to be mindful of time, and I want to make sure I can answer any questions that you have. Uh, but I did want to take you through a, a quick walkthrough of the history of crypto and sort of what modern algorithms look like in a scaled down way. So Mark, hey Justin, uh, one of the comments from one of the teachers said that the students kind of looked like it was similar to Sudoku. Can you address the uh, uh, what it would the appearance of Sudoku versus what you've shared with them? Sure. So Sudoku, uh, the, the I think when we think about computing things with mathematical algorithms and formulas, it's just a natural thing to want to arrange them in terms of grids. Because when you kind of go beyond formulas and when you're looking at ways to solve uh, those kinds of mathematical puzzles, uh, it really helps to think about shifting numbers in multiple directions or looking at the arrangement or permutations of things. It, it just kind of plays to the fact that mathematics are full of patterns and arranging things in grids and matrices just tends to lend itself very well to looking and analyzing and understanding those patterns. So there's not really a clear connection you know, between cryptography and these puzzles as far as how they're laid out. Like yeah, in cryptography where it's not so much trying to figure out these arrangements of numbers and trying to fill in these blanks, but the one area that they do have in common is just that, again, it's easy to work on numbers when you lay them out in grids this way. It just so happens that these patterns, they, they become a lot more visible and understandable when you look at grids. Thanks, Justin. Are there any other questions? This is the opportunity to, to ask questions from one of the masters. Don't be shy. Uh, there isn't a, a, a bad question out there. So if you want to put it in the Q&A, that's great. Uh, we have people here who are live. And, and if you want to come up on, on your microphone and ask the question, you can do that as well. 
is it pretty normal that we're mind blown and we have no idea what's going on when it came to the last piece of the presentation? Because all of my students are like, oh my god, I'm trying to focus, stop talking to me, Mr. Lambert. So we're trying to figure it out. So is this something that it's an eye training? Is this something that takes a while for us to kind of get a used to? Is it normal that we're like, what is going on here? Or how does that work? It's normal because, so if you were to take this and set it up in your class with the instructions, and I've done this for, for a number of different schools and workshops, it probably takes, I would say, around 25 to 30 minutes to really walk through and explain what the algorithm is doing. And I know I walked through it pretty quickly. It's hard to do in a short amount of time just to focus on that without Q&A. But it takes about 25 to 30 minutes to set up this algorithm and sort of walk through from start to finish. Really, the, the key components there are understanding sort of how to shift columns and rows and then how to use those numbers to determine what goes in what direction, how many times. Uh, so if you're looking at this for the first time, I mean, this does mimic modern algorithms. So this is not the standard way you might think about codes and ciphers when you're thinking about them outside the context of modern things. You might be thinking about a Caesar, what they call a Caesar cipher, which is just, you know, shifting the characters a number of bits forward, and then that's your secret message. So you're not looking at it or thinking about it in terms of rows and columns. So it's, it's very understandable that it would seem foreign at first. Uh, but once you sit down and you can dedicate, let's say, an hour uh, to running through this example uh, and then decrypting it, it becomes a lot clearer. It's really, there's not a lot of complexity to it, but it just takes dedicating, you know, let's say, you know, 45 minutes to an hour just to make sure you've absorbed it versus the advanced encryption standard, which might take you a number of years uh, to really master the linear algebra and all the different types of mathematics that go into really understanding not just how it works, but why it was built the way it's built. That's that's sort of the, the, the way I'm separating the math required for the complex stuff from the very you know minimal math that you need to to navigate through something like this. Hey Justin, if you could share with the uh, the folks, I mean we've got some high school kids on here, and 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 they're probably looking at you know what is cryptography all about, and sure, and and also the whole field of cybersecurity. If you could Absolutely. kind of maybe share with them what got you interested in in doing this work, and and maybe some of the things that they can look forward to if if they pursue this type of career. Absolutely. So I'll start with why I got into it. So, you know, I've I always liked competition. One of my earlier dreams in life was actually basketball. And I still play a lot of basketball today. I grew really tall when I was a smaller kid, but then I kind of capped out around six feet. And I realized that the NBA was probably going to be hard for me to get into. So I started to look at other interests that I had at the time. And that was, you know, in the 90s, computing was you know, kind of becoming a thing with the home desktop and the internet was still fresh and alluring. And I'm like, okay, how can I take this, this competitive streak I have and this adversarial sort of strategic mindset and turn it into something that I can do uh, and excel in probably much more easily than, than that pro basketball. So I was really interested in computer security. Uh, now in the nineties, things were much different. You know, not everyone had computers in their home yet. And the, those that did, not all of them had the internet. We weren't, you know, using mobile phones. iPhone didn't exist. Uh, so a lot of things weren't really thought about the way they are now in terms of security. But I realized early on that I wanted to do something that had a, a profound impact on society that really helped us think about the importance of, of how we care and nurture and maintain security and privacy in our society across our technologies. Because, you know, from the 90s into the 2000s into now, We've had this explosion of, you know, technology and a very rapid adoption of it. We, we've been innovating and advancing far more quickly than we've really been understanding how to secure all this stuff because a lot of what we're building has such a benefit to society that we're just sort of building and going with it and then thinking about the security after the fact. You know, and that has certainly has its drawbacks. You know, when you don't think about the security, sometimes you uncover things uh, far too late than you wish you would have. So for me, getting into computer security was a way for me to have an impact and know that I'm working on things that, that impact citizens in a positive way and help secure everything from e-commerce to nowadays election security is a really big deal. That's sort of at the forefront of 
security research. So things like that that have an impact. You know, you're doing good work, uh, but it also, you know, really satisfied my my need to to compete, even if it's with these adversaries that you'll never see or meet. But you know that there are other really smart people that are using their knowledge to try to uh, gain some malicious advantage or to some nefarious end. And we we might, you know, it, it's hard to say you know, how things will develop in security over time. But one thing's for sure, there's always going to be this, this adversarial element to it. Uh, and it's certainly strengthened my own knowledge to be sort of, you know, on the edge at all times about, you know, staying abreast of new developments and thinking about new ways to make things safer and more secure. So that's, that's really what got me into it. And I can, you know, talk a bit about sort of how you might get into it and things to look for as you're, you know, in high school, you know, looking at college, uh, kind of looking at different programs. Uh, I know that um, here on the West Coast, both Berkeley and Stanford are sort of beacons for cryptographic development. So there will be very clear signs if cryptography does become something that you're interested in. Uh, there are schools that excel with it uh, very clearly. They have really strong departments in cryptographic research. And there are also um, uh, a number of universities that have um, uh, connections with the NSA, the programs that meet a very high level of excellence in computer security and cryptography. So I would definitely recommend exploring specific programs at schools that you're interested in. But, you know, when you think about cryptography, I know a lot of you might be thinking about mathematics and that you have to get a math degree. And that's totally not the case. So if you do enjoy mathematics and you like the theory and you really see yourself working on, you know, writing and researching papers and being sort of at the forefront of development, things that might be so far ahead of the time that we won't see them in practice for years to come, but you want to be at that cutting, that bleeding edge of research, then I would, you know, highly implore you to look into the mathematical fields, you know, linear algebra, you know, group and field theory, things that you might not even touch in high school, uh, but all within that mathematical realm are good if you want to take the research path. Now, if you want to go into computer science and you, let's say you want to be an engineer and not do so much with the mathematics, just taking a certain set of fundamental math courses, but kind of sticking with software engineering, hardware engineering, understanding what it means to write secure cryptographic code, that's an entirely different area. So not all mathematicians will necessarily be able to implement cryptography securely if they don't know how to code. And the same could be true for engineers. They wouldn't necessarily know how to design a secure algorithm without having the mathematics. So it's possible to go into computer science in a way that you can learn how to build secure cryptographic code and implement it safely, which is really one of the downfalls of cryptography in practice. The math is totally fine. It works out but it's the code that's faulty in many different ways. And that's been an issue for a long time. And that's one area, That's one of the areas that government and military tends to excel at uh, because of their long history of depending on special purpose hardware for the field. It really has to be secure in its implementation. So that's another path. You know, like if, if uh, military or government type of operations interest you, you can certainly get into that information assurance uh, capacity with the government where you're really working on things that, that take what you're going to learn in academia and really, really push it to the extreme because of the importance of uh, implementation security uh, in government and military applications. So you have those two two very clearly definable paths of going the mathematical route and the computer science route. But I'll also, you know, this involves some cryptography, but cybersecurity in general We've learned over the years that it's not just computer scientists and mathematicians and engineers who are important for security. Security is also a very human thing. So if you have interest in sociology or psychology, or anthropology, understanding how people work, that plays very heavily into what, uh, what we call operational security uh, and really thinking about our behaviors, uh, thinking about you know, how we handle the data that we're computing, how we use and set up the environments and the devices that we're using for computing, and really understanding why humans make the decisions they make. Because if you go back, uh, especially the Cold War era and World War II, you'll see lots of stories in espionage, very almost James Bond-esque stories about very elaborate espionage campaigns where really the, 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 the key downfall to many of the different actors were exploiting the human behaviors. It wasn't the sophisticated technologies uh, that brought people down. It was just exploiting human nature 
and how humans operate entirely differently from code. So if you're not, let's say, so much in the computer science or mathematical side, but you still have an interest in cybersecurity, understand that you can bring psychology into that. You can bring sociology, the human element. And also the the economics, you know, looking at numbers, not just from building algorithms, but looking at how the motivation for a lot of cyber attacks are very financial and very economical. Understanding that element is key to really researching and building better practices and processes for how we build systems. So there there are a number of different areas that you can come at cybersecurity from. And I'll even add this one, too, because I, I did a talk some months ago. And one of the first questions was about Fortnite, which was uh, kind of hitting its its peak at that time. Uh, so we had a lot of Fortnite players in that class. And I'm like, well, if you think about gaming, it's really important for games to be fair and to prevent people from cheating at the game. Otherwise, nobody wants to play because if they don't have that unfair advantage, they're going to be losing a lot. And the, the fun element is going to be taken completely out of the game. So cryptography and a ton of other security controls are used by gaming companies and platforms to make sure that, that people can't cheat or it's extremely hard for them to cheat. Uh, so if you like cybersecurity and you're also into gaming, you can get into the engineering side of making sure that, that game platforms are secure. Get a job at, let's say, Sony or work for the Xbox team. They have dedicated security people that work at gaming companies. So it's not what you might think as far as sort of being isolated to just thinking about security in and of itself. You're thinking about it in terms of the applications that really appeal to you from gaming to banking to election security to the psychology of security. So there are lots of different ways that you can come at it. So just know that whatever your interest is, there is very likely an application for cybersecurity. uh, And you might find that that's the best way to, to think about getting into the field. Thanks, Justin. Those are really good comments. Do we have any other thoughts or questions from folks on the call today? Okay, I'm waiting on my students. I'm, I'm giving them a little nudge so they can ask questions because they all have questions that, as I said, I'm running on two platforms, so I'm trying to coordinate. But as a, I always tell my students, there's a cool program we used to use, Grasshopper, and you use the algorithm to create an interactive facade so it kind of actually calculates the sun rays and the way that the sun reacts and behaves and let the rays in. So I always show them all these really cool programs and how those things interact. And, uh, you know, we're career technical education, so we're project-based learning where all the students have all kind of really cool ideas and all kind of different things. So although it's free architecture and engineering, I always tell them, what is it that you're interested in? Mm-hmm. Because eventually it's all going to tie in into something that you're going to be you're gonna be excited about. So, Justin, can you tell us about, besides the basketball, when you were back in high school, what was your interest in and how did it shift completely or maybe you stayed on the same path? Sure. So the... the first introduction I had to cryptography was with the uh, Navajo Code Talkers. So back during wartime in World War I and II, not just the Navajo, but other uh, uh, indigenous people from the Cherokee to the Apache, a lot of the, the languages back then were not written languages. Or, and those outside of those, those groups of people had very little understanding of those languages. So the Navajo Code Talkers, for example, would handle radio communications using keywords in their language that corresponded to military terms or operational terms. Uh, And this was incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for adversaries to understand because they didn't have any of the context. Number one, it's a good chance they didn't even know who the Navajo people were, and these words made no sense. They didn't follow any patterns. So that was my, my first interest into cryptography because it was like, okay, I was really into the study of indigenous people in the Americas, and then there's these secret codes, and it's World War II. It's like this thing that I had no no idea existed was was possible, and it happened. It happened a long time. So I was curious about what modern cryptography and modern security looked like. So that was really the catalyst for my early interest. How I sort of developed, you know, I was really hardcore into the mathematics of it early on, but then I realized that you know, I was born in the 80s. I was born far too late to really come up with any of the, the mathematical discoveries that existed by the time I got into cryptography. So I did shift to working more with engineers looking at the secure coding practices to build secure code. Because it's as you get into coding, you very quickly realize there are many ways to code things. Uh, some are fast, some are slow, some are very brittle, some are robust. Uh, so the engineering side really interested me. And then I got into studying more of the 
sort of the human element of it, from the psychology to the sociology to the user experience side, understanding why people made decisions around security and privacy that they make and how we can use that to inform what we're actually building. Uh, because until you understand the problems of society and the, and the problems that face humans in day to day world, it's really hard to know what you should be putting your efforts towards. So I think we're at a point where we understand enough about how the technology works and can be built. So I'm in this place now where I'm looking about how we should be applying this technology in most effect. So that's sort of a, a quick. Hey, Justin, we have technology. two other questions for you. One is, what is the job of a cryptographer? And the second one is, is this a good job for going into the military? Sure. Both great questions. So the job of a cryptographer, and this, this goes a bit back to the two paths that I explored with computer science and, and mathematics. You have cryptographers who, uh, their job is to, let's say within the capacity of their university is to research, you know, cutting edge applications and theory around how to design secure cryptography. So you could be one of those cryptographers where you spend all day, every day in research, you know, really pushing the limits of what we know and understand about cryptography. If you're what we might call an applied cryptographer, you might have some of that knowledge. You might work a bit in research. You might, let's say, be a professor and have students who that you'll co-research with and write papers with. But you also work sort of in the development of applications of cryptography in the real world. So you might spend your time not thinking so much about the theory, but thinking about how to take our current understanding of that theory and building things with it or using it to inform sort of what we adopt in society, whether that's processes around, you know, secure voting or how we look at e-commerce, the protocols that are in your web browser that affect the security of what you purchase online. That's more of the applied side. Uh, so those are the, the, the two main realms of what a cryptographer would do. Now, kind of going into the next question about is this good for the military? It's absolutely good if you're going into the military. And that's essentially where cryptography started, was in this militaristic application. And I mentioned very briefly earlier that in the military, so, sort of where their advantage lies is they have access to all public cryptography, but they also have access to all the classified work that they were doing far before academic public cryptography was a thing. So there are very likely many areas of military cryptography that are far more advanced in terms of secure coding, hardware security. So if you kind of like both the military and cryptography, the military will give you the opportunity to really get into things that are so much more hardened and secure than what you find in the consumer space because the stakes are much higher. Like if, if something fails with the cryptographic device in the military, lives could be lost, missions could be lost, the positions, troops could be revealed. There, there are a ton of different things that could go it, it just wildly wrong with cryptography fails in the military. So the attention they give to very specific things, especially hardware security and operational security, are going to be a lot more extreme, but perhaps more engaging because within that context. So I know the Navy, for example, there's a, a group called the, the Navy Cryptologic Interpretive Technicians. That's one. Uh, I know a lot of folks that have gone through that. And with that, you can do things like learning other languages. So there is the Defense Language Institute out here in Monterey that can put you through language training. So outside of just learning how cryptography works and is built to be secure, you can find yourselves on missions where you're decrypting messages in other languages. You're, you're becoming an expert in foreign language, not just cryptography. So, yeah, military is definitely a great place to explore uh, crypto as a career. We have another really good question, and, and I think it, it is a very intelligent one. So it was, uh, how does cryptography incorporate into the aerospace engineering or aerospace field in general? That's a good one. So you can think about, I mean, aerospace technology, when you're, when you're trying to come up with a list of the most impactful and forward-thinking and advanced set of technologies, you can think of aerospace engineering as something that a lot of nation states want to be leaders in. So, and, and Michael mentions the term intellectual property or IP. Cryptography is going to be key in securing these blueprints, these plans, these advanced technologies. In large part, not because they're just important from an industrial standpoint, but aerospace and military and government, they sort of go hand in hand. So if you think about building out aerospace technologies for use in the military, 
you might not want this information to leak out. And I put that very mildly as an understatement. This is highly guarded information in the military. So cryptography is going to be really important for securing that. Now, when you think about the actual technology itself, if you're putting aircraft in the air, it's going to be essentially one big computer flying through the sky. The computing technologies that automobiles and planes and different kinds of craft rely on today, it's much different than, let's say, a century ago, when things were much more mechanical and relied less on computing power. So these computers will have cryptography baked into the mm -hmm. the, uh, the hardware components. So as you build these technologies, you're going to need to update software or firmware that's running on these devices. You're going to need to make this technology uh, able to connect wirelessly to different types of machinery to get these updates to communicate, to communicate back to radios on land, let's say. So all these different components require security because if the cryptography is weak, someone might be able to break the communication between aircraft and land. They might be able to inject some malicious code wirelessly to an aircraft that turns off key functions like being able to uh, to go the direction you want it to go or to stop or break if you're talking about you know, uh, automobiles or, or any kind of autonomous vehicles. Drones, that's a really big uh, area that, that's sort of exploded in the past few years. So yeah, and, and Michael mentions another thing here, pacemakers. And so even outside of the aerospace industry, there are tons of other devices that we rely on that affect the well-being of people that are now communicating wirelessly, that we really need to ensure that this process is secure. So cryptography is fundamental to aerospace engineering in that, you know, the, the stakes are very high for this, this technology, either getting into the wrong hands or falling apart because someone was able to hack into the, the computers and inject some malicious code. So it, it is a key component. Thank you, Justin. I think we're uh, up up with our time. Uh, I really appreciate everybody joining us today on this uh, cybersecurity chat series. Justin, thank you so much for being with us. This was the inaugural event for this school year. Uh, we have these cybersecurity chats every single week. So please feel free to check our site, ccei.nepris.com for all of our future uh, cybersecurity chats. And, and on behalf of the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Nepris, and, and all of the students and teachers who joined us today. We really appreciate it, and have a great day.